Um, thank you all for coming. I'd like to welcome you to the uh, Fat Tuesday edition of the EOL seminar series. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm really pleased to uh, introduce Helen Warden as our speaker today. Helen holds a bachelor's degree in physics from CU and a PhD in elementary particle physics from Cornell University. Following graduate school, she uh, took a sharp left turn into Earth Remote Sensing Science section at JPL, and she was there for a number of years. Presently, she's a scientist in ACOM, and she is the US principal investigator for the Moppet instrument on the Terra satellite. Her primary research interests are uh, satellite remote sensing of air pollution and climate change. Today, she's gonna tell us about two decades of global carbon monoxide observations with Moppet. Helen. Thanks, Mike. So, um, a quick history of Moppet. Moppet's a Canadian-built instrument and it was also funded by Canada, and it's on NASA's Terra satellite, and it would not exist without Jim Drummond. So I want to acknowledge Jim Drummond, who's the Canadian PI. And then on the US side, the, the first uh, US PI was John Gilley, followed by Merritt Dieter, and now myself. So I'm privileged to follow that history. Um, and I want to acknowledge the entire NCAR Moppet team for the results in this talk. So a quick outline, uh, Moppet, um, I'll talk about the instrument and how it measures carbon monoxide. Um, I'll talk about global pollution transport that we can see with Moppet, the emi emission trends of carbon monoxide, and then what we can say about co-emitted species um, when we have these emissions, such as aerosols, uh, carbon dioxide, and methane. And finally, I'll hope to get to the observations of CO from space in the future. So, so why CO? I always show something like this because people might think it doesn't matter that much um, unless you need a new carbon monoxide detector in your house or you're stuck in a tunnel with really old cars. You probably don't care that much about what CO is like if you walk outside. Um, but it actually tells us a lot about atmospheric chemistry and climate. The main sources are incomplete combustion, so from both fires and fossil fuel, and then biogenic emissions and hydrocarbon oxidation are the other big half of that. Um, the primary sink is oxidation by OH, so that means that more CO would mean a longer methane lifetime because there's not a, as much OH to destroy methane. It's a precursor to carbon dioxide and tropospheric ozone, so it makes those greenhouse gases. And because of that, it has an indirect radiative forcing of 0.22 watts per meter squared. So it's not as high as, say, ozone, but it's, it's on the same order of magnitude. Um, the lifetime is weeks to months, so that means it's transported globally, but it's never evenly mixed. So you can always see it above a, the, a background level. So you can measure plumes from fires and uh, cities. And then, like I was saying, the, the direct emissions of CO are about half of what is in the atmosphere. And those are from anthropogenic emissions, which are relatively stable year to year. But a large part is from biomass burning, which has a lot of interannual variability that I'll talk about. And then there's a couple other about 20 teragrams per year from the ocean. And then this is the direct emission from plants, but plants also emit quite a bit of um, VOCs that turn into CO, and I'll talk about that as well. And then another big chunk of it is from methane. So some quick facts. Um, we are getting to 20 years here. It'll be the Terra at 20. Uh, we'll have the celebration at AGU and, and a special issue and some other things will be going on. Um, but it's pretty amazing because the design life was six years for all the instruments. So there's five instruments on Terra, um, Aster, Ceres, Modis, Miser, and Moppet. Um, and as I said before, the Moppet instrument itself is a US-Canadian collaboration. So University of Toronto is responsible for the instrument, building the instrument, designing it, and the instrument operations that they uh, command through the Goddard folks. Um, 
Here at NCAR, we're responsible for algorithm development and data processing. So I'll talk more about this type of instrument that we have. It's a, it's a unique space instrument at this point. Um, HALO is sort of a precursor, but it, that was looking in the limb, and so it's fairly different. So I'll get into that. Um, Terra is in a low Earth orbit, so at 705 kilometers <coughs> with a 1030 equator crossing time. So it's, I don't know if anyone knows the history of EOS. It used to be, before it was Terra, Aqua, Aura, it was AM, PM, CHEM. And so Terra was in the morning orbit, Aura was in the PM orbit, and then so was CHEM, which is, I'm sorry, Aqua was in the PM orbit. But at any rate, um, we're in a morning orbit, and we're in a constellation with a Landsat, I think. So we get 16 orbits a day, and that gives us about three days for global, co co takes about three days to get global <clears throat> coverage with Moppet. And I'll show you the swath in just a moment. Um, our pixel size is 22 by 22, so not very fine resolution on the ground, but not bad either. Um, and then we measure vertical profiles of carbon monoxide in both the thermal infrared and the shortwave infrared. And then we have a really high or really fine spectral resolution, but it's an effective spectral resolution that you can see when I talk about the, the GFCR measurements. And right now we only retrieve cloud-free cloud scenes. Um, and you can see that in a moment. And then finally, the, I'd just like to put this up, uh, Terra cost $1.3 billion, which sounds like a lot, but considering it's almost 20 years old, is probably a pretty good investment, especially since a lot of uh, the data from Terra are operational in a lot of systems. Um, and oh, and then for perspective, Moppet cost about $75 million just the instrument, and that, again, that was from Canada, so. So, this shows Moppet near real time data in Worldview, NASA Worldview. So you can see it, um, well, I'd like to show this one because the near real time products are, are operational for NASA, GMAO, and also ECMWF. Um, but I'd like to show this because it shows the, NASA, the Moppet swath and you can see we don't have anything where we have a big cloud, cloud feature. Um, and then you can also see where CO is really correlated with, with aerosols from MODIS. So in the orange, yellow to orange colors, we have MODIS aerosols, we have MODIS clouds, and then you can see the Moppet data going through that big plume of aerosols, and you can see where we had also high carbon monoxide. And you can see some other correlated spots in the fires in South America. So, but I really like to show this because this, this day, 7th of September, was just like Armageddon. You had this big plume of smoke coming from Canada, and then you had three hurricanes, Harvey, um, <laughs> Irma, and Jose, I'm not sure which the order was there. So everything was just getting pounded that day. Um, so how Moffitt makes measurements? Uh, we use, again, thermal infrared and shortwave infrared. And you have the band, the CO band at 4.6 is the fundamental, and then you have a weaker overtone, overtone band at 2.3 microns. And what gives these two different bands really unique structure or sensitivity in the atmosphere is the fact that one is solar reflection. So the 2.3 band is basically um, measuring reflected sunlight, which gives it sensitivity all through the entire column. But it doesn't, re it doesn't give you a lot of structure, vertical structure in that, but you do see all the way to the surface. Whereas in the thermal infrared, you're relying on thermal contrast, which for most of the Earth does not have a lot of difference between the, you know, the bottom layer of the atmosphere and the Earth itself. And so your P 
peak looks like this because you have, this is where you have a maximum of both thermal contrast and abundance of CO. So using that information together is what I will talk about in a second. So Moppet, again, is a gas filter correlation radiometer. And so it measures in the nadir. So, um, and like other infrared instruments, it has to do a calibration using a black body and then a cold space view to get the cold temperature side. And then it measures this radiance from the Earth, which has these spectral features. But instead of going through, say, a grading spectrometer or an interferometer, it goes through a gas cell. And what the gas cell does by modulating uh, either a long path or a short path with either the length of the cell or the pressure in the cell, you can get two different kinds of transmission spectra, one for low optical depth and one for high optical depth. And by taking a difference in an average of those two types of transmissions, you get a signal that looks like this, an average signal and a different signal. The average signal gives you information about the surface and the general um, radiance of the atmosphere, whereas the different signal has information only in the spectral lines. So that's where you're getting your information about the, the gas, just that gas in the atmosphere. And then this goes to a detector arrays that are separate for the thermal infrared and the shortwave infrared. So now onto the data products. Uh, this is fairly common terminology for all of the NASA EOS instruments, level zero through level three, where level zero is the raw data, level one is calibrated radiances, Level two is the retrieved product. Um, in this case, we use optimal estimation to get vertical profiles and total column. And I'm not gonna go through this in detail except to, to show what we actually produce as products. Um, all of this is done by minimizing a cost function where you have a priori information. This is the a priori profile. This is the a priori covariance. And then why are your radiances, and this is a radiative transfer model with your measurement covariance. And then we output the averaging kernel and error covariance matrices as a diagnostic. Um, then level three are gridded daily and monthly averages, and validation is done using in situ data where we really rely on NOAA flights, and then re more recently HIPPO and ATOM QCLS uh, CO observations to give us latitude information. And there's a series of papers by Merritt, Dieter, et al. Our latest version is V8. So to illustrate the level two products, I want to show a comparison to ATOM. And so this is taking all of the Moffitt profiles within 500 kilometers, six hours of the an ATOM Pacific profile. Uh, this was on the first campaign. And this is the um, lat long of that. So what you can see is all these pink fine lines are the separate profiles. This is the a priori that was used for these retrievals. And it does vary by latitude, but for this uh, scene, it was about the same. This black line is the actual ATOM observations, and then the green line is what you get when you apply the, the Moffitt averaging kernel to that, and then also the prior. So you can see that um, the pink lines, and this is the standard deviation in those, is really matching pretty well to the smooth ATOM data. And this is what an averaging kernel looks like. So, I'm gonna show some more of these so it's good to understand what this is. So this is the pressure, and then these are the averaging kernel rows uh, with color coded by the pressure. So since this is an ocean scene, um, a pretty clean ocean scene, you can see that we don't have a lot of sensitivity near the surface, and that even the, um, everything in, from like 200 to 500 is sort of peaking around this 300 
hectopascal level. So that's really where our, most of our sensitivity is. But we still have some in the lower trope as well. So now looking at how that compares to ATOM, this is the, the Moppet ATOM difference. And you can see that compared to the zero line with what we think are the error bars for all of our profiles that we're doing pretty well. OK, so now the benefit of making multispectral measurements. Um, so this is just our product nomenclature. In this case, it was V7. And we have V7T products are for the thermal infrared. V7N, we used to sort of mix up near infrared and shortwave infrared. So we used N to, to begin with. And then V7J means uh, joint. So that's using both of these together. And you can see from the averaging kernel that if you just use the thermal infrared, that you, you still have some, this is all, all over land, this is like the average. You still have some uh, sensitivity at the surface, but not a lot compared to the middle troposphere. And then like I was saying before, for the shortwave infrared or the near infrared, that information really looks pretty straight up and down like a column. And then when you combine these two, now you get something where you're really taking the fact that you are sensitive at the surface here, and you know a lot about the middle troposphere from here, and combining those two gives you a lot more information about the surface. <clears throat> and then you can see this in an example of what level three data is. So you have uh, the thermal infrared. It, uh, this is uh, level three data at the surface, the near surface level. So you have the thermal infrared. Um, you get a little bit more information at that level from the near infrared. And then finally, you can really see a lot of the sources that you expect um, in that combined product. So going on to just our, um, our total record from space. And I like this because you can really see pretty much everything in, in just one shot. So this is the total column CO. So this is just taking everything in the atmosphere, adding it up, and producing the molecules per centimeter squared. And it's the zonal average by latitude. And so I've just averaged all the longitudes. And so this is just a function of latitude and time. And then the colors indicate higher values. So what is really interesting in this part is you can see what you expect in terms of um, the southern hemisphere just has a lot less CO than the northern hemisphere because of those anthropogenic sources are just a lot higher in the northern hemisphere. <clears throat> and then when you take um, the subtract off the month average, month record averages, you can see the percent anomalies. So that's just taking out the seasonality of this and looking just at the interannual variability, now you can really see um, the big events that we, we know about. These are boreal fires from 2002 to 2003. Uh, this is the 2007 or 2006 El Nino, which went into some a little bit in 2007 in terms of burning. And those were some fires in Russia. And finally, this is the really big event we had from 2015, the 2015 El Nino. And you can see this really persisted a long time uh, in terms of high elevated CO. But the main thing you can see in this is this overall decline over the, the Moppet record. So that's what I'm going to really talk about when I talk about the emission trends. But first, I want to say a bit about what you can detect with uh, carbon monoxide for global pollution transport. So this is just one month of an average month from 2010, October 2010. And it's nice that you can see what happens with fires. So when you have uh, the, the, the biomass burning events in September, October, November, or well, October is a big month. When you have the burning in this part of Africa, the transport tends to go out here and then go back around there. And then eventually it all just goes 
south and towards Australia. So <clears throat> what I want to talk about is what we really saw uh, for transport from the fires in Indonesia in 2015. So as you all know, 2015 was a really big El Nino year, the biggest one since 1997. And uh, Indonesia was very, very dry. So this is the, just the average monthly rainfall for September 2015. And it's just like nothing for the whole month of September in this part of Indonesia. And this is the corresponding amount of CO that we observed at near the surface for, for that month. And this was at record levels for Moppet. So the highest we'd ever seen. And because we can get a pretty good vertical profile, we can look at what happens to all of that CO from the Indonesian fires. So this is, uh, these are all cross sections looking at this longitude range. And um, this is in August, September, and November, uh, October. And so for, for August, before the fires really got started, there were a little bit going on still, or starting. But what you really see is this uh, large amount of CO. This was actually some fires in Russia. And it follows in this Asian monsoon pattern that is well documented. And then when you get to the Indonesian fires that really got going in September and October, you can see um, this interesting rabbit ear structure. <laughs> but it's basically, it's right at the ITCC, so it gets pumped way up high right away and then goes uh, north and south. And this actually would look more like an atomic bomb pattern, <laughs> except for that Moppet doesn't measure with where there are clouds. And so right in the ITCZ, we have less data. So what um, another thing that we've looked at, and then including that 2015 El Nino data, is the fact that we can actually do a pretty good job of predicting interannual variability of CO with a statistical model that uses climate modes. So in this case, we're using ENSO, the Indian Ocean Dipole, the Antarctic Oscillation, and then the Tropical Southern Atlantic uh, Climate Indices. And what this shows is the model fits not only um, overall coefficients, but also a lag time. So in the case of maritime Southeast Asia, you, you, you don't have any lag time. It's basically when ENSO is there, everything gets dry. And if you burn anything, it's going to have a lot of CO emitted. Um, and then these other, other indices had less influence and longer lag times. And then, uh, in this case, it was explaining 75% of the inter interannual variability. Um, and then in northern Australasia and so south Australasia, we did pretty well as with the explaining the variance, but um, the lag times are pretty different as well. And then this just shows the anomaly in CO. And then the black dots are the model and the red or blue dots are the measured anomalies. So you can see it, it's a pretty good method for predicting when you're going to have high CO. And that could be important for, for example, for air quality in Indonesia. So now I'm going to get into CO emissions. Um, when we do a top-down estimate of CO emissions, it's very similar to just uh, estimating the retrieval or the, the CO profile, except now we have um, a cost function where x is the emission state vector with some prior, y are the CO retrievals with the error covariance, and then f is a chemical transport model, but it um, also includes the averaging kernel because it has to match to y. So it's basically the model, but what the spacecraft would measure from that model. And then we look at three sources of CO um, in, the, in the 
um, the next things that I'm going to be talking about. So biomass burning, fossil fuels, and then biogenic, where this biogenic term is not just the direct emissions of CO from plants, but everything that turns into CO from, say, formaldehyde and, well, isoprene, which goes to formaldehyde and then to CO. So you basically, each grid box in the model, which in the case I'm going to talk about next was four by five degrees, so pretty big, each grid box has its separate prior for each of these three things. So in this case, we're looking at results of a, from assimilating Moppet in the GeoSchem model. And these are the anthropogenic emissions. And you can see the, the trend um, from 2002 to 2016. So it was 15 years. This is in Jiang et al. And the three different lines here are experiments that he did to look at the result of um, when you try to assimilate either the column, which is black, the profile, which is blue, or just the lower profile. And the lower profile alone is, is, um, was problematic. So in general, the column is probably the, the most robust result. But you can see that they, they do converge to about the same thing. So in general, you have a downward trend in the United States, Europe, and then you have a downward trend in China starting about 2007. Whereas it's hard to say what the trend might be in the rest of these areas. And then globally, it's, it's a downward trend. So this was different than what, for China, than what is predicted by most bottom-up emission inventories. Um, basically, everything is extrapolated and you know, China was just going up and up and up. So, which is real. And the only one that's really showing a negative trend is an inventory called Mayek um, from Ting, I'm not going to say it right, <laughs> Tsingsao University in Beijing. So, a more recent paper looked at this in more detail and this is also using Moppet data. And it's using a French model that I'm not going to describe, and also Bayesian inversion. So here you have the a priori emissions that went into this study. And then the emission trends, which you can see in blue, are mostly declining over China. And then this really looks at the whole bottom-up uh, inventory from Mayek which really includes um, all the technology changes and the use changes by sector. So blue is residential. This is construction materials. Yellow is gasoline vehicles, iron and steel industry, industrial boilers, and then power plants. And I want to point out that power plants do not emit a lot of CO. Because if you have a power plant that emits a lot of CO, you've built a bad power plant. Because it's <laughs> um, not. It's, you, you really want complete combustion in your power plant. Um, so you can see that, for example, in residential sources, this went down a lot. And part of that is because China has been converting to electricity from, say, burning uh, you know, braziers and coal or, or wood in the, in the residential areas. Um, so converting to electricity is going to mean a lot less CO, but a lot more potentially other things from power plants like NO2. But I'm not going to get into that. So, so again, this is compared now to some other bottom-up inventories. And in this case, this is the result for all of East Asia, the red line. And it, it's not really agreeing too much with the other inventories. Whereas if you look at just in China, there's a couple of them that are, I think are trying to account for these technology changes. And then this blue one is the Mayak one that it agrees pretty well with. So that was anthropogenic emissions. Now I'm going to go to fire emissions. And fire emissions, uh, to look at that, I want to point out a paper from 2017 by Andela et al 
that just looking at burned area, you can see a real decline in, in global fires um, since from 1998 to 2015. So it's been, a, it's about a 25, almost 25% decline over that period. Um, the top part here shows just where you have these big fires. So in Africa, in South America, in Australia, some in Indonesia, those are more sporadic though. And then this shows the trend. So you can see that for the most part, it's going down everywhere except for this part of Africa. And I'm, the top-down emissions also show a lot of, uh, also show this trend in CO emissions from fires going down. But I thought this plot really um, shows what you could see just looking at CO trends. So this is just the Moppet trends in total CO column. And I've subtracted the global mean trend of 0.43% per year. And that lets you see, one, that you know, a lot of the globe is just declining at that rate. But this area in Africa is actually going up. And you can see where those emissions come out here. And you see that increase, or relative increase there. Whereas from South America, you see that whole transported CO going down. So that really matches well with uh, what this paper is showing for burned area, with the emissions going up here and down here, and then also down in here. Oops. OK, finally, on to biogenic emissions. So biogenic emissions uh, play a very important role, as a lot of people know. Um, uh, one of the main uh, emissions is isoprene, um, but there's, there's other ones that we need to worry about as well. And these oxidize and then turn into uh, secondary organic aerosol. And then on the, the gas phase, they turn into ozone formaldehyde, which is also measured from space and used to derive isoprene, uh, CO, methane, and then I should point out that Formaldehyde also produces CO, so that's included in our total budget for CO from biogenic emissions. So these have been controversial lately, and I like pointing this out because um, there have just been a few questions about what do we do for, for climate change mitigation? Do we plant trees, which might emit more biogenic emissions, or do we cut down the forests? Um, it's a good it's an important thing to answer. So unfortunately for Nadine, she did not get to say what the title of this op-ed was. <laughs> and so to save the planet, don't plant trees, uh, actually got her death threats. So, um, and that really wasn't the point of her op-ed or her paper, as, as I'm going to show. It was just mo mostly that you really have to include biogenic emissions in your climate models. But there are, more recently, there have been some other things as well that are basically showing that, that you have to be careful what, what trees you plant. So this is the, the climate effects of cropland expansion. So this is the paper by Nadine Unger. Um, and it's basically the effects from pre-industrial to present of, of changes in human land use and what they've done to uh, biogenic SOA, ozone, and methane as compared to um, these other effects, like if you cut down the forest, then you have less CO2 uptake, and so you have a delta in CO2. Uh, you have a change in surface albedo, which might be a cooling effect. And then you have uh, the net effect of the climate pollutants that she sees as cooling. So she got 0.11 watts per meter squared cooling and that's by saying that you have this much SOA coming from it, and, um, or this much less SOA, and this much less ozone and methane. So she found a net cooling effect. But in this paper by Scott et al, from um, looking at what the projected changes in radiative forcing due to total deforestation. So that might be an extreme case, but they wanted to do something um, 
definitive, I guess. Um, and so in their model, they also included the short-lived climate forcers from aerosol cooling and also ozone and methane greenhouse warming. And I'm not going to go into the separate uh, terms here, but for the global um, impact, they did find a positive radiative forcing from cutting down all the trees. And this is because in their model, they found that the biogenic emissions um, were positive or warming because the decrease in aerosol cooling was not completely offset by decreases in ozone and methane, which were warming. So the emissions of uh, biogenic, well, the biogenic emissions for these things are, are very critical for understanding what path we should take going forward. So what can we say about it from Moppet? And this is going to be sort of a, um, a bit hand wavy, but, but basically we're going to apply this thing called a Markov chain Monte Carlo flux partitioner, which I've depicted here as a meat grinder. That was sort of my uh, initial impression of it. But when we look at the total CO flux that was constrained by Moffat in this paper, um, this paper was not able to partition the different um, biomass burning, biogenic, and fossil fuel terms. Uh, so it just scaled, basically, or partitioned it according to the prior. And because of that, you can't really estimate an uncertainty. So using this flux partitioner, we basically did another Bayesian um, estimate. And with that, using uh, more updated uncertainties in each of these inventories, so the GFED biomass burning inventory, Megan 2.0 biogenic, and fossil fuels from Edgar, uh, we now can come up with a pretty good estimate of each term with uncertainties. And you can see that um, the biogenic term is actually bigger for this, in terms of teragrams per year for 2005 to 2012, than either of the anthropogenic or biomass burning. So I, I need to do a quick um, explanation of what Megan does, the Megan model for biogenic emissions. Um, this is from a paper by Eloise Murray, who looked at Megan emissions of isoprene compared to OMI top-down estimates using the OMI formaldehyde observations. And she found that Megan really significantly overestimated a lot of the isoprene emissions. And this is in the term for the basic inventory. So this is the emission flux under standard conditions. But these other terms could matter as well. So you have leaf area index, the sensitivity to the above canopy radiance, sensitivity to temperature, leaf age distribution, and soil moisture. So all of those things have to be in there to get the Megan emissions right. And I'm not going to go too much more into that. Um, but there's seasonality that we can see with the Moppet CO. Um, but I just want to show the basic comparison for, for the spatial pattern between CO and isoprene. So this is, again, estimating all the CO, not just the direct emissions of CO from plants, but what plants contribute that turns into CO, say from formaldehyde, or isoprene and then formaldehyde. And you can see that basically you have the highest values in the same places where you have the high values of isoprene. And we see a similar pattern for top-down, I should Sorry, I should say that this is um, estimated from um, a Belgian group, um, Bura. And we find that in this case, um, so this is isoprene um, estimated from ECMWF using Megan, and this is the top down. And so you can see that the top down is getting a lot smaller values for the tropics, mid-latitudes, and the global value. And we see a similar pattern in the CO, 
So this is using Geos Chem and Megan. Um, for the tropics, we see a lower value, about the same for mid-latitudes, and then a lower value globally. And you can compare this to these other terms from biomass burning and fossil fuels. So now we have an additional independent constraint on the Megan model using CO observations, as well as the isoprene that's estimated from formaldehyde space observations. So on to co-emitted species. Is everyone still with me? <laughs> um, so what can we do knowing these emissions or not being able to estimate CO emissions um, or assimilate CO data? So I'm going to talk about now what we can say about aerosols, carbon dioxide, and methane. So first, aerosols. Um, this is a, a study done uh, from fires that happened in August 2015 in the Pacific Northwest. You can see the MODIS fire count was really high during that period. And this is the aerosol map that you get from the deep blue MODIS AOD product. And so we're going to look at what we see from the aerosols and the carbon monoxide. For the carbon monoxide in the free troposphere, or the middle troposphere at 500 hectopascals, you really see this pattern of transport across, this was like, I think, across five days. But at the surface, for those same days, you see a map that really matches the fire map, um, especially up in here. So, so from Moffitt data, you can see where the sources are and where the transport is. And using that, you can correct what you know for AOD because Total AOD doesn't tell you anything about where it is vertically. And so you can actually correct the vertical distributions in, in this case, the CAMCAM model, doing, a, doing an assimilation of Moffitt CO. All right, so now on to our favorite greenhouse gases. Um, so these are the NOAA trends in CO2 and methane. And obviously, we want to know what's going to happen there. Are they going up or down? Um, well, we know CO2 is just going up. But how can we um, figure out elements of the growth rate and other changes that depend on emissions, as well as these feedbacks and interactions between climate, energy, and water cycles? So this is work done at JPL uh, using the carbon, monitor, carbon monitoring system um, flux estimation. And so it's another, another meat grinder, but this time it's taking in CO2 from OCO2, solar-induced fluorescence from GOSAT, and CO from Moppet. And it's using all those things to try to infer net CO2 fluxes gross primary production, which is from photosynthesis, um, biomass burning, and residual respiration. So one of the main results from this was published in 2017. And what um, Junji did was to look at what happened between 2011 when, when we had a La Nina to 2015 where we had an El Nino. And relative to 2011, uh, the 2015 El Nino re released 2.5 gigatons of carbon uh, more than, than uh, this La Nina. But where it did this is, uh, or the, the diversity in this is really striking. So obviously in Indonesia, this carbon was released by fires. But what happened in South America and Africa is quite different. And they found that the real change in South America was actually because GPP went down, so there was less uptake, and so the net flux was positive. And then in Africa, there was an increased respiration. So you really need a model like that to try to separate out the different processes. And you need different kinds of data to inform that. And in this case, Moppet really is telling you where the fires were. So on to methane. Um, this is a result actually from 
my brother at JPL, and what he found also using the MCMC flux partitioning to figure out the, in this case, methane from fires, um, was that since fires have been decreasing, this actually decreased methane by about four teragrams a year since the 2000s. And in tropical fires, I should say. Um, meanwhile, you have other estimates of methane that were increasing from wetlands, about 12 teragrams per year, and increasing from fossil fuels, about 17 teragrams per year. And if you add those up, you get 29 teragrams per year, but the observed global increase is about 25 teragrams per year. So this really was just a, an important piece of the puzzle to figure out um, that these estimates probably are okay if you include this decrease of four teragrams per year from fire. All right, now on to what we have done here at ACOM um, in terms of assimilating Moppet data to come up with a Moppet reanalysis or a CO reanalysis. This is work by Ben Galbert. And so he's been applying uh, the CAMCAM -CAM model with DART and Moppet observations. And I don't think I want to read each of these things, but you're um, basically taking Moppet observations at this sort of um, spatial distribution, combining it with the CAMCAM -CAM model in a forecast mode, and um, producing a reanalysis. This is, these are the increments from the data simulation. So in this reanalysis, there are four basic runs that we need for looking at what's actually happening because you've assimilated CO. So this is the Moppet reanalysis that, that is reported um, from ACOM, and that assimilates Moppet every six hours. It assimilates um, updates of CO concentrations, and it uses an ensemble of 30 CAM-CAM simulations. Then there's a control run, which is the same setup, but it's um, not assimilating Moppet. So it's assimilating the meteorology, but not Moppet. Um, then another control run that was CAM-CAM nudged to the MERA reanalysis, and that's just to look at different effects of meteorology. And then finally, a control run that um, is the same as this one, except that now it's using the updated CO fields from assimilating Moppet. And so the only difference with this, the control run now is CO. So it has the same meteorology, which is MERA, but you can look at just the difference from CO and not meteorology. So looking at all of these, um, this is now the Moppet reanalysis, the control run with the Moppet um, specified CO, and then the regular control run that just assimilated meteorology. So this is methane lifetime in years as a result of this reanalysis, and this is OH um, versus time as well. So what you can see from this is that if you look at the change in methane lifetime from here to here, it's about a nine month decrease because of CO decreasing. So again, what we said is that because the OH has gone up, it's going to decrease the methane lifetime because CO has gone down. And what is good about this is that you can see in the control one with just the specified CO observations that it also just, it has a different overall lifetime, but it follows the same pattern and has the same decrease, the net decrease in lifetime. So it's not due to a change in meteorology. All right, finally, finally on to the future of uh, carbon monoxide from space. So 
um, this shows all of the low Earth orbit satellite instruments that measure carbon monoxide, starting with 2000 Moffett. Um, and then everything that's come along since in the infrared, and everything that's come along in the shortwave infrared. So Skiamaki uh, was on MVSAT, and that uh, measured till about 2012, I think. Tropomi just uh, launched, and I'll show that in a moment. Um, and then we have a, a whole variety of measurements from, from the infrared, starting with AIRS, tests which came and went uh, Yazi A, Yazi B, Yazi C, which just launched last November, and then two CRIS instruments on NOAA satellites, SNPP and NOAA 20, which also just launched recently. So Moppet is still the only one that measures both of these. And so we'd like to be able to um, use these in some way to extend the Moppet record. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of this. This is basically a comparison of Moppet, SNPP Chris, and S5P Tropomi. Um, you can see when they all launched, they're all in um, somewhat different orbits, but Chris and Tropomi are in pretty close formation. So they're um, following each other, or Chris is, is right ahead of Tropomi. Um, and then the pixel size for CO in Tropomi is seven kilometers. It's better for NO2. Um, it's like three and a half by seven. And then now we have global coverage in one day. And, and then really good effective resolution for Moppet. Um, good, it's not, it used to be only 2.5 inverse centimeters, which you couldn't do a lot with from the CRIS instrument, but now they're doing what they call full resolution mode, and that's 0.625, so that's really pretty good. And then for Tropomi, uh, again, since it's a short wave infrared, they're doing just a full column. So it's really hard to compare uh, the any delta T, so. So what Tropomi measures now is every day a really nice map of CO and NO2, which I'm not showing. Um, so this is one of their first results. It was in a GRL paper recently. And so you can really see, this was from October, so this is when you have a lot of burning in both, North and, uh, both Africa and South America. You can really see India, a lot of the expected sources, and then Asia. So one of the first things they did was to compare with to ECMWF CAMS model. So this is Tropomi and this is CAMS. And the nice thing about CAMS is that this, this already assimilates Moppet and EASI data. So you're really getting the benefit of comparing this was not available when Moppet was launched. So, but for Tropomi, they can really look right away and see if they're getting something similar to a reasonably accurate model. And you can see there's some differences, but for the most part, they see a lot of the same patterns. So here's how Moppet compares to Tropomi. This was just a very preliminary result, and we're working on more detailed comparisons now. But, but basically, we're almost on a one-to-one -one line here, which was very gratifying to see. So, so we really think that um, it's going to be pretty easy to use Tropomi data along with Chris data to extend the Moppet record. And so finally, what, um, what we expect to do, this is a simulated result for both Chris and Tropomi, but what we expect to see is that this is an example of the averaging kernel, uh, multispectral averaging kernel for Moppet using the, the thermal infrared and the near infrared. This is Chris alone, Tropomi alone, and then Chris and Tropomi together. And what you can expect to see from this simulation, this is the geoschem model for a CO near the surface. 
Um, if you just use tropomy, you do pretty well, but you don't really see much over the ocean because it's looking at the shortwave infrared and you need reflected sunlight, which is only good over land. In a couple cases over clouds, you can do it, and that's what tropomy does for ocean observations is they use the reflected sunlight off of clouds. Um, but near the surface, you're not gonna see anything. And then Chris alone is sort of like the Moppet thermal infrared result. And then tropomy alone, I'm sorry, this was the joint product. And tropomy alone is fairly similar with no observations over the water. So we, we're hopeful that we can use uh, Chris and tropomy together to get a similar product for the joint thermal infrared, shortwave infrared, Moppet data. So finally, in conclusion, um, we see global CO concentrations decreasing, but still with significant interannual variability from fires. Um, we understand changes in CO emissions, and these are critical for chemistry climate model modeling. The top-down constraints from satellite CO observations could, re could be used to reduce uncertainties in biogenic emissions. And satellite CO observations are essential for assessing the global carbon cycle. So we have promising results from tropomi, and these could be used with Chris to extend the Moppet CO record of multispectral CO. So thank you. Ellen, uh, we have a little time for questions. Questions. I really um, did take the whole hour, didn't I? I, I have a question. About the uh, Moppet reports a surface value for CO. Is that true? Correct. How, I think we how have do you actually? How is that constrained? How you? Because you can't. Really it make it a actually represents the near surface layer. So it's the average from the surface to whichever pressure level on this 10 pressure level grid it is. So let's say that the surface is at 10,000 and you're, it's, it's actually gonna be at the pressure in between 10,000 and 900 hectopascals. What? 1,000. I'm sorry, yes. We, we, we understood. <laughs> yes. So, so yeah, that, that vertical profile is reported on 10 levels, but they're actually re representative of, of the full layer average. Because you're right, you can't measure something with, with no layer depth. Right, yeah. yeah. Anybody else? So I'm interested in that um, the estimation of OH from CO, um, which yeah, is of... probably just a direct um, effect of how much CO there is. But I'm wondering if the actual seasonal cycle or spatial distribution of CO, say at high southern latitudes, um, would actually tell you something about the OH concentration. I think um, CO alone would not, but I mean, we're one of the things like that uh, Kazu Miyazaki has done with trying to estimate, do an assimilation of multiple species to estimate OH, um, I think is more promising. Um, this is just the result. It's not, it's, it's not, it's like how OH changed basically because you assimilated CO. But it's right. not, you can't yeah, say, that's right. that's, I mean, so Ben it doesn't, can say more, yeah. it's not oh. the absolute OH value, so. And it doesn't necessarily comment on other evidence of interannual variations in OH. No, 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 it's only the change because of assimilating CO. Any other questions? Well, let's thank Helen. <laughs>